Hi, I'm Rob Millard. I recently had the opportunity to repair a Circa 1810 car table, and I was immediately struck by one of the joinery techniques used on it, something I had not seen before in the context of period furniture, and that is the front apron was joined to the front legs with a loose tenon. And when I first saw that, I thought, that's not an elegant or craftsmanlike way to accomplish that joint, but I quickly realized that it was the only two tenons that had held together over the table's 200 plus years of its existence. So that got me to thinking about mortise and tenon joinery. Now, in a period context, you have a chopped mortise. And even in the best hands of the best craftsman, that has the potential for some rough sides. Then you have a sawn tenon, which again, even in the hands of a competent craftsman, has a less than optimal glue surface. So you combine those two and you have a, a considerable potential for failure, like I saw on the card table. The reason I think the front apron joint held together was because it, the tenon had been planed, so it had a much better a glue surface and it cut in half the inaccuracies in that joint and that's what I think is uh, the reason for its longevity. So that got me to thinking about my own work. Now I've always cut my mortises either with a router or the mortising attachment on the drill press. The router leaves a, a excellent glue surface, the mortising attachment on the drill press a very good glue surface. But I've cut my tenons by hand and that's not out of some romantic stick in the mud connection with the past. It's just the way I work, it made sense. One, I, until recently, I didn't have a table saw that was uh, really accurate. And the other is, is that the uh, mortising gauge was so quick and easy. I mean, it struck a line and it saw to that line. Not really hardly any margin for error, no setup time, very quick, straightforward type thing. But once in a while, I would get a tenon that would be undersized and I'd have to glue on a piece of veneer or I'd get one that was oversized and I'd have to stand around and plane it to fit. So I wanted something that would be quick, wouldn't require a lot of uh, testing, you know, just measure and go like I did with the mortise engage and uh, still made a nice smooth tenon. Now some people will make tenons on the table saw by using a dado head and then they, they flip them over. Well, uh, I can't do that. Uh, I've not run across the board that come out on my surface planer that, that it's that consistent. And the uh, dimension that's thrown around or the tolerance that's thrown around on tenons is five thousandths of an inch. That's the difference between a good one and a bad one. Five thousandths over, it's going to be too tight. Five thousandths under, it's going to be too loose. Now that's, that's a pretty small margin when you consider newspapers uh, three thousandths of an inch thick. So if your thickness of your stock varies, so when you flip it over, your tenon is naturally going to vary. And a lot of times I'll see where people say, well, I saw them oversized and plain them to fit. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to have it right from the saw, perfect fit with no fussing around. So that 5, 000, with that 5,000 uh, tolerance in mind, that's going to require some machinist type uh, setup on that. So let's delve into how that's done. First thing we have to do is get some baseline measurements of things. And we'll begin with the kerf of the blade that you intend to use for the tenoning. In my case, I'm using a thin kerf seven and a quarter inch diameter blade. I know that's an odd choice on a full size table saw, but I like the way it works. And that gives a kerf of around a sixteenth of an inch. So I'm going to take a drill bit, a one sixteenth inch drill bit, and uh, a couple feeler gauges here and see just exactly what is the width of that uh, kerf. And I've already done this and I know what it is. Uh, seven thousandths plus the thickness of the drill bit is pretty good. Eight thousandths is just about perfect. It's a nice snug fit in there. So that uh, tells me that the total width of the kerf is around sixty-nine thousandths of an inch. Now we have to measure the width of the finished mortise. And in a machine shop setting, that would probably be accomplished with either gauge blocks or adjustable parallels. And so inspired by that, I came up with this idea. I took two shims that are used for hanging doors, and I, cut the, I had to cut the one off to get to fit in the mortise, and push the other one in beside it with their you know, slopes opposing each other so you have parallel sides, just like you would if you were hanging a door. And I pushed those down until I got the kind of resistance that I would want on the finished tenon. And then it's just a simple matter of using the dial caliper across there and measuring that. And I was surprised to find that it was very close to the nominal dimension of one quarter inch. It's about four thousandths over that. So we have 0.254 inches for the width of our finished mortise. 
Now I'm over at the table saw and I have got the board clamped in the tenoning jig with its show face against the fence and that's important that you keep that consistent. If this were a, an apron to a table, if your apron stock were varying thicknesses, it wouldn't matter as long as you always kept that outside face against the fence of the uh, tenon jig. In essence, all your inaccuracies would be moved to the inside. This particular project, I'm doing a face frame, so again, the inaccuracies would go to the inside. If I were doing something like a door, well, I would hope there weren't any inaccuracies and that would be a function of your stock preparation. You'd want all your stock to exactly the same thickness. And where exactly can mean different things. When you're talking about the tenon, when we're, we're saying that five thousandths of an inch tolerance between a good and a bad fit, uh, yeah. When you're talking on the a face frame, it's not going to take a whole lot of time to sand away five thousandths of an inch, so I would still call that perfect in, in as far as uh, joinery is concerned. So now I've got the uh, piece in here and for this cut it will be supported by the table of the uh, tenoning jig. You can see that when I slide it back here. And I've scribed a line just as if I were doing it by hand so I have something to set up to. Now when I move it over for the next cut it won't have any support so I've got this stick that's the same thickness as the uh, tenoning jigs uh, table so that I can have some support on there. And the other critical setup is to get this saw at exactly the right height. If you don't go up high enough, you'll leave a little step in the corner there that'll keep the tenon from going all the way home. If you go too high, well, you'll be able to see that uh, in the finished piece. So it's important to get that very accurate. And you, now you don't have to do this, but I invested in a uh, an old-fashioned uh, surface uh, jig, surface gauge. I'm sorry, surface gauge. Uh, bought this on eBay for not very much money. They're, they used to be very common and they're almost like a dinosaur now. And they're just kind of a work of art really. And with that I can uh, dial it right in to get the perfect height setting. All I have to do is just take the uh, scriber point, put it at the right height over there, and come over here and transfer it to that. And I can rotate the teeth around and gauge it within a very small amount. I don't know what it would be, but it'd be on the order of thousands of an inch. So now we're ready to make the first cut. Now I would go around and make all light cuts on the pieces and then change the setting to arrive at the desired size of the tenon but don't move anything until you have all those first cuts made. Here's a better shot of that surface gauge that I was using in the last shot. Uh, I bought this on eBay. I think I paid $9.95 plus shipping for it. And uh, it's a Lufkin. It was probably made in the 40s or 50s, I'm guessing, something like that. And like I said, it's, it's a work of art, really. It's got a uh, scriber here that's got a straight point and a curve point, and I was using that curve point. And then uh, this post here, I got this dog down pretty good, but it's adjustable front and back. And then when you get it adjusted close to where you want it, this screw here pivots this arm in and out, making it a fine adjustment. And then on the bottom, it has these two push-out pins. And I've been using that to guide along the bed of the lathe to describe parallel lines on turnings, like a uh, making the dovetails on a tripod table. So this is a mostly a machinist tool but I found some uses for it in the shop and while they're plentiful on eBay at relatively re reasonable prices there's also some uh, newly manufactured ones of maybe questionable quality on the Grizzly website. Here's a quick drawing of what we're going to do. We've got a, a dial indicator that's going to be placed and you'll see that in a moment on some surface doesn't matter which one and that's going to be moved over the amount that is equal to the desired thickness of the tenon and the thickness of the saw curve 254 for the tenon 069 for the saw curve for a total of 0.323 inches when I go ahead and move it over what the uh, math says it will be without any deductions for the uh, clearance that you would want for the uh, finished tenon 
and the, most of the time, for reasons that I can't fully explain because the math is there, this results in a tenon that's the right size for my setup. Your setup might be whatever, but as long as you don't move that dial indicator after your first pass, you can change. If it's too thin, which is one of the reasons I don't deduct anything, uh, if it's too thin, well, you can change it. You'll have to glue a shim back on that first tenon. If it's too thick, which is the most likely outcome, you can move it over, and by this time, you'll have a very clear indication of how much you'll need to move that over. So let's show it on the actual saw setup here. Here's the actual setup at the table saw, and it consists of an inexpensive dial indicator that I got at Harbor Freight, and then this magnetic base holder. These are very common in machine shops. It's a Mighty Mag. I purchased this on eBay for about $15, and it's uh, got several holes that are drilled and tapped in it that you can mount indicators in various positions and it's a very strong magnet so it's not going to move and I have it indicated here on the upright of the uh, mortising jig and I picked that spot because you could put it on any place that was going to move it didn't matter where you put it but I picked this here because I can make the cut and leave this in place now there's also I'm sure a way that you could mount it over here on the off side of the jig and have it indicate on something that would stick up on the jig and have it a permanent mounted part to your uh, mortising jig but I like this arrangement here because it leaves the jig unencumbered and I don't have to uh, drill and tap anything it's just a magnet and I can use this setup for other things too I have some ideas about how to use this for uh, ripping off thin strips so I got the indicator set at zero going to loosen the knob here on the uh, tenoning jig and crank that over until I have that 323 setting that I need and make the second cut and test and see how it fits. So we're at 323 right there. Lock it back down. Sometimes as you lock it down it moves it a little bit but usually not much. And when I first got this uh, tenoning jig and I set it up I put a dial indicator on it and got this face perfectly parallel to the uh, miter slots so you get a nice accurate cut out of this so I'll just go ahead and fire up the saw and make a cut do not retract the ten ending jig through a spinning blade that off cut piece could become trapped and create a hazard I'm back here at the bench and I've sawn away the haunch part of the tenon so I can test it in the mortise to see how the uh, setup was. And there are some rules of thumb about how much tension there should be on a mortise. And uh, one of them is that you should be able to drive it together with your hat and have it hold together under its own weight. I think that's a little too loose for me. I want something that I have to give it at least some maybe downward pressure. Not a whole lot of rocking but some downward pressure so let's try and see how that one goes together. And I had to rock it right at the end, but we got uh, nice flush faces. There's a little bit of a step, but that's again more uh, from my ta uh, surface planer than anything else because the outside face that's towards me is uh, nearly perfectly flush. Got a little step here on the back side, and it holds together under its own weight. And to bring it back out isn't too much of a problem. And also, uh, the camera won't be able to see it from that distance, but it's an absolutely beautiful tenon. It's smooth, it's clean, there's no overcutting, uh, and so I am sure that this one will last at least 200 years. I hope that you can uh, incorporate this technique into your shop. Thank you for watching.